right, it is just after 1.20, so I think we can go ahead and get started, if everybody feels ready. Um, there are, oh, first of all, this is writing about Python. Um, I hope you are all here for this workshop. If not, the, they did move the rooms around, so it's been a little bit confusing. Um, I have a couple of tutorial housekeeping notes they've asked me to share. Um, the afternoon's break will be at 3 p.m. in the lobby. Uh, we'll break at that point so that everybody can go get snacks. Um, there are power outlets around the room, but probably not enough, so please share the outlets. And there is a survey link for this tutorial, which I really hope you wait until after the tutorial to fill out. But uh, the link is up here, and I will just leave it here for anybody to grab. All right. So, let's start with some introductions. I'm Thursday Bram. I've been writing about technology for over a decade. I've written blog posts, case studies, documentation, ebooks, and so very many social media posts, mostly about technical topics. I'm the editor of the Responsible Communication Style Guide, which covers how to write about identity in the context of technology. And through that project, I've worked with a bunch of amazing people who, some of which are in the Python community, um, some of which come from other tech communities. I've also uh, written the Python style supplement to the Responsible Communication Style Guide, which is about writing about Python inclusively. And that was released a week and a half ago, so before I got here. <laughs> Um, I've been a member of Pi Ladies. I co-organized some conferences. You may have seen me around. And since we're going to be spending the next three hours together, I was thinking we could go around the room and introduce ourselves so that I get an idea of who you are. Um, and if you want to share uh, any sort of writing projects you're already working on or what you're thinking about writing next, that would be awesome. Can we just start up here with you? Hi, my name is Andy Trosak. I'm a uh, web developer, uh, primarily writing projects around technical documentation uh, for my team and other teams in our organization. Awesome. Hi, uh, I'm Anthony Sharon Collins. I'm the lead technical writer for Salesforce. Uh, I'm here I'm going to be um, demonstrating how to do the Salesforce Pi docs, which uh, I just recently updated. Uh, we're using Okay, we'll work on that. So, my name is Andy Knight. I'm a software engineer in Southwest Virginia, Maryland, Raleigh, North Carolina. I blog at automationpanda.com. Uh, my name is Emma Yorino. I'm a postdoc at Python. And from time to time, I have to write papers that is about the code and the results of that code and try to find out my style and how to do it. Great. You want to, we can do the snake um, around, yeah. Uh, Blake Waddle, uh, <coughs> network infrastructure at SRE at Bloomberg. Um, outside of technical documentation, so I own uh, modules and uh, projects, so I've been doing a lot of uh, I'm looking for help people. Great. My name is Jeremy Goldman. I work at FedEx as a developer manager, and I end up writing a fair amount of technical documentation for Pi Ladies. Um, also, guidelines for developers on how we do packaging and other things, and I'm working on improving our documentation for a new computer for the project. Awesome. I'm Sean Perusha, um, developer, and I need to write a lot more reviews. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris Cordero, um, also a web developer. Uh, I, I write my own blog, which I felt really uh, updated quite much, which is very good, and also
No worries. There's um, some chairs up here as well, a few. Oh, no worries then. All right. So there's definitely going to be something for all of you in this workshop. Um, we're not going to dive too deeply into documentation itself, but we are going to talk about a lot of things that affect documentation. And I really like starting anything like this by telling you exactly what I'm going to tell you. Um, I think it's the easiest way to get started. So <clears throat> in this workshop, we're going to learn how to effectively write about Python. We're going to be talking about some general mechanics of writing on technical topics, as well as some Python specific topics, which include uh, major pitfalls in Python communication, common Python audiences, strategies for editing and testing content, um, and writing opportunities in our community. We're gonna do a couple of exercises to practice strategies, um, though they'll be a little bit different than the average uh, workshop exercise at PyCon. You will not be writing any code in here. Um, we're going to write prose instead. So this may be a little bit different. Um, before we get started, I also wanna note a couple of specific topics that I'm gonna to cover that could be uncomfortable for some audiences. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about race, gender, ability, and age along with ways uh, Python communi community members have been marginalized in the past. All right, so Python and prose. This is, this is where I live. <laughs> and I'm so glad all of you wanna hear about it. Um, so uh, the Python community as a whole uh, talks more about communication than a lot of our counterparts. Um, I have a personal theory about this. Uh, my theory is that Python has kind of a special status in a lot of newsrooms. So a lot of journalists use it for data journalism, um, for web apps, that sort of thing. But I also think that Django's development is a really big factor in this. Um, one of the most widely used Python frameworks came directly out of a newsroom, out of a daily newspaper. So as a result, we're a little bit better, I like to think, than some other communities about our documentation. We've got decades, actually, of good examples to build from. Um, we've got some really great trained communicators in our community already who we can use as models. And we have some tools that can help us writing prose as much as they kind of help us with writing code. But writing code is definitely a different process than writing prose. One of the biggest differences is in the needs of audiences for each. The primary audience for Python code is the Python interpreter. It's a format intended to be readable by machines. We talk about the readability of our code in this community a lot because we value being able to understand our own code without mechanical in intervention, but it's still an, written first for an audience that is not human. So we value human readable code because we humans are responsible for creating it, maintaining it, and our future selves always thank us for clear and understandable code, but they really, our future selves really like us when we document things, not just leaving code for them to look at. So humans are a secondary audience for Python code. Uh, most people who will look at code have at least a little bit of a passing familiarity with Python, a little bit of technical knowledge. To get to the point where you're looking at actual code, you kind of have to have that knowledge. But prose, in comparison, is much more accessible to humans. Uh, humans without technical knowledge can come across uh, prose much more easily and understand it than code. So as we write for humans first, we want to keep that in mind that we are talking about audiences, about humans who are going to interact with this. And I kind of like that better than writing code because humans give much clearer and much more useful feedback than error. <laughs> so we're gonna do a deep dive into writing prose specifically. All right, so. Let's talk about the pitfalls of writing about Python. Um, 
As I worked on the Python style supplement, I conducted surveys and interviews with a bunch of members of the Python community. We talked about um, where they get their information, what books and blogs and other materials they rely on. And at the same time, I took that opportunity to talk to these folks about what problems they had with reading about Python, what issues made learning and using Python harder for them. And there are four issues that I heard and saw over and over and over again. And those issues are right here. Um, going through a tutorial and it won't work because I'm using Python 3 and the tutorial writer used Python 2.7, but there was no indication anywhere on the tutorial. Um, the writer basically told me to go read the code without giving any context for what that code does and just assume that I would be able to figure out what was going on. Uh, there's the question of what all of our acronyms and jargon mean. I, I am particularly um, entertained by how many variations of the letter uh, PY and PI there are <laughs> in our community. Um, trying to get somebody to tell the difference between these three without any additional information is incredibly difficult. Um, and then lastly here, I can't find anything written about a particular Python project. So if I'm looking at a library or a framework that may have some documentation but may not have the documentation I need. So as writers, we wanna avoid these pitfalls. But those, that version of them, I'm sorry, but Um, so these are rewritten from a more writerly perspective so we can actually talk about them and act on them rather than relying on a reader's approach. So as we're writing, we want to make sure that we're telling our readers which versions of Python and other dependencies we're using. And you may hear me talk about that a lot because that is one of my pet peeves. I cannot tell you how many times I have like gotten a submission of a tutorial to look at or something like that and somebody has talked about how great their Python tutorial is but when I look at it I can't tell you if it's for 2.7 or 3, not on a surface glance and a newer user definitely won't be able to. Uh, we also want to create context for our code. Even sample code is not self-documenting. We have to put some words around the code for our human readers because they're not going to respond to that material in the same way that machines are. We're also going to need to explain and disambiguate the jargon that is how we talk about Python. We have a lot of um, very specific terms that we use within Python, but that are used different ways outside of the Python community, which can change what shows up in search results, it can change who's looking at what we're building. Um, one of my favorite examples is if you've seen the Palettes Project, if you attempt to Google just for like Palettes Project, you get pages of Pinterest projects of taking apart uh, uh, shipping pallets and putting them back together again. So it is, it is not easy to figure out that you're looking for uh, a Python tool unless you have a little bit more of that context, that disambiguation. Um, we're also looking at uh, how we get resources to create and promote new writing, especially on open source projects. Open source um, projects sometimes suffer from poor documentation because there's just not resources to throw at it. Um, writing is something that takes time and often money. So we're gonna go deeper into these pitfalls, but I wanna keep, want you to keep these in mind. And I am also going to add one more pitfall to the list. I wanna uh, suggest that you think very carefully about setting your own expectations about what Python programmers know at different points in their careers. Um, Python programmers can have a wide variety of knowledge. So let's talk about that one first. Uh, so 
when we're planning what we're going to write, we need to know who we're writing for. And within the Python community, we have loads of options. The Python community is not just one giant homogenous whole. Even if we're just talking about the Python skills individuals might have, we're talking about a range starting from people who copy and paste Python scripts without a clue of what they're doing, all the way through to folks who have doctorates and other advanced degrees in computer science and understand all the bells and whistles under the hood. So writing something that is useful to every Python programmer on that spectrum is hard. Um, it's also kind of rare. I'm a professional writer who writes about these topics a lot, and I almost never am writing something for the entire Python community. Instead, I write for smaller sections of that spectrum. Um, sometimes I'll rewrite the material in different ways so that different uh, skill levels can access it, make it useful to different audiences. But usually I have a specific group in mind that I want to be able to use a tutorial or a piece of documentation, and I need to know what they're coming in with, what information they might already have. So talking about these differences in the, in the abstract is kind of difficult. So let's talk about this in a more concrete way. So these are personas. These are a few different personas that we can find in the Python community. They are entirely made up. Um, but we can talk about how each of these personas would respond to different types of writing. This is a concept that actually comes out of marketing because I have spent many hours in the marketing minds. And the idea is that we can sort of give these people characteristics that will then be able to um, match up with in our writing. Um, so we have Pat, the newer Python dev. We have Piper, the experienced Python dev. We have uh, Nat, the non-programmer. Ruby, the experienced in another language dev. And Darby, the decision maker. So these are my imaginary friends, and I have gotten to know them very well. Pat uh, is a recent programming boot camp grad. They're on the younger side. They love Game of Thrones, and will get every reference to that show that you put into an article. But Pat can't tell you the difference between Monty Python and the Mickey Mouse Club. They weren't around for any of that. Ruby, in comparison, got started programming when COBOL was the hot new thing. Ruby hates all programming languages equally. Ruby also reads XKCD and probably knows more about Python's Easter eggs than Python itself. That's probably going to change next weekend, though, when Ruby learns enough Python to get through a job interview. Darby, in comparison, isn't a programmer. They're not responsible for writing code. Instead, Darby gets to decide on whether to use Python to build new projects for their startup. Darby has money to spend. We like that about Darby. Uh, Darby also has titles like VP of Engineering or CTO on their resume. Um, we know that Darby has worked internationally because they love football, but not American football. They like to point that out. So you'll notice that I'm uh, very deliberately fuzzy about the gender of these people, and I'm also very fuzzy about the race, because personas are not good tools for figuring out how to address um, facets of identity like gender or race. These personas are my imaginary friends. They're out of my imagination, and they're a product of my experience. They can't know anything that I haven't experienced. The furthest outside of my own experience, I'll let them go, is that Pat is a Game of Thrones fan, and I've only seen like two episodes. But personas are really valuable when we're looking at work and educational experience. Uh, we'll talk about some other strategies for inclusion on those other facets later on. But in the meanwhile, since we know these uh, personas, we can talk about some characteristics we're going to assign to them. So this is a um, graph out of the Python Softwares Foundation uh, survey of Python programmers from 2018. And this is one of my favorite sources of information about Python programmers. Um, for example, I know that because of, because 
50% of Python programmers also use JavaScript, I can assume Piper, our more senior dev, has some JavaScript knowledge. They may not be like 100% perfect at it, but they're experienced enough to know how to Google their problems. Pat, though, our newer programmer, might have some JavaScript knowledge, but probably not enough to know what to do when something goes wrong. We're gonna wanna add more context, link to some resources, and give Pat more of an idea of the basic information when we're writing for them. As it happens, because Pat is my imaginary friend, I know Pat's bootcamp curriculum. Um, it was very thorough, and Pat did get to go through a JavaScript class, but Pat still wants to know why Java has its own scripting language, because even the most thorough curriculum is not going to cover naming decisions that happened when Pat wasn't yet in kindergarten. So we can make similar uh, assumptions about Piper and Pat's familiarity with popular frameworks, libraries, um, and serves the same way. This survey actually has a lot of information in it um, that I'm happy to go into later, maybe during the break, uh, just so that we don't get too off track. But these are really useful pieces of information. They let us make assumptions. And assumptions are only as good as the data that they're based on. So I like using the PSF survey, even though it's based on self-reporting, because the PSF puts a lot of effort into uh, contacting different Python communities and getting respondents from all over the world. There are probably some people who don't fill it out, but the data is pretty good. In contrast, some surveys of insular communities don't give us useful data. If you take a look at Stack Overflow's developer survey, you would be working off the assumption that 11% of women are, 11 of programmers are women. That's a gender disparity in programming, but it's actually different than uh, the more general disparity that we know about. In most programming communities, we're looking at closer to 24% women, and that's based off of surveys by a company named uh, Accenture, who basically specializes in surveys. So if we took a look at the Stack Overflow information, we would be making some incorrect assumptions. So we want to evaluate where we're getting this information from. So another thing that we know from the Python survey is that the Python community is growing and is just continuing to grow. That expansion means that we kind of have to talk about growth, what growth means for our personas in the long run. Uh, since our community is starting to trend younger, which I think is great because it ensures longevity in our community, but that also means that we're getting community members who associate Monty Python with their grandparents. I have literally talked to a Python programmer who said, Monty Python, I think my grandma watches that. Um, that made me feel old, but it also is a really important thing to think about. If they don't know what Monty Python is, they're not going to get references to it. Our community is also trending more global. Uh, we have many uh, programmers in the Python community whose first language is not English. And only a fraction of Python writing happens in other languages. So. English language documentation is important for all communities, which means we have to make it accessible to all communities. So both of these trends impact how we can write about Python. Um, as more people use Python, we can't assume that everyone will have access to the same media, watch the same movies, get the same jokes. Um, we need to think about context when we use references outside of the community whether we're explaining an Easter egg or we're trying to explain why a certain decision was made in a certain way. Humor is particularly tricky when writing about technical topics. Jokes tend to need a lot of context to explain if you don't get it fairly quickly. Even puns require knowledge about like pronunciation. So without that information, 
it's not funny and it can even be a little bit of a distraction for somebody who is spending time trying to get the joke instead of reading the rest of your article. Um, I will be snarking about Monty Python a lot during this talk. Um, I, for my project, I watched all of Monty Python, including the episodes and the movies. And well, let me put it this way. Uh, punching up is funny. I feel comfortable making fun of Monty Python. Um, the members of that comedy troupe have made bank. They have lots of defenders out on the internet and I'm okay with, you know, making fun of them or snarking about them. In comparison, punching down or making jokes about people who are not powerful is not funny. It's not interesting. It's frankly boring. Um, and if I want to want to watch somebody make jokes at other people's expense, I can just watch the news at this point. So we want to think about like the message that we're sending anytime we use humor as well. Are we punching up? Are we making fun of a group of people who already have a hard time? So let's talk a little bit more about Monty Python. Uh, <sighs> When Guido uh, named the Python programming language, he was referring to Monty Python, not a random snake. Um, for anybody who hasn't experienced Monty Python, we're talking about a British sketch troupe who turned 45 episodes, which were made between 1969 and 1973, into a full-on industry with movies, books, games, musicals, and many other things. Um, this year is Monty Python's 50th anniversary. So when I say people kind of are starting to associate it with their grandparents, it's because it's 50 years old. I'm making sure to describe Monty Python in a little bit of detail because we can't assume everyone using the Python programming language is culturally fluent in Monty Python. We might as well be asking programmers to get references to the Beverly Hillbillies or Petticoat Junction or Green Acres, none of which I could even get a joke for, and I watch a lot of old TV. That isn't necessarily a problem, but some jokes also age better than others, and Monty Python is not aging particularly well. Um, by expecting Python programmers to be familiar with Monty Python's body of work, uh, we might be sending them on searches that will lead them to lists of sketches that include things like titles with the N-word in it. I don't think any of us want to accidentally send a Python programmer to something like that. We don't want to distract from the programming for sure, but we also don't want somebody to feel excluded by that. So, let me be clear, I'm not saying you can't ever make a Monty Python reference again. I, what I am saying is that we all have to consider the context of our references before we slap them on projects we want to share with the whole world. I'd ask you to think about it kind of the same way that you might think about putting a picture of an actual Python in the middle of eating something on your project's homepage. No matter how cool you are personally with snakes, there are a lot of us who will respond to a picture of a snake by clicking away as fast as we can. Um, that includes me. I like cute snakes. I like cartoon snakes. Real snakes, not my jam. All right. So since we've been talking about humor, we can talk a little bit about some of the other styles that we see in Python. Python does, you know, have a little bit of a, a humorous aspect that I think some communities don't have. Um, but we also have some really standard styles that we can talk about as well. Um, so we have PEP8, which is the style guide for Python code. Includes naming conventions for variables, um, method names, that sort of thing. It does not include suggestions on, for how to write prose about Python, but some of its instructions are just as useful for writing prose as for code. PEP8 prioritizes for readability and consistency. Uh, both of which are excellent instructions to take to heart when writing. Uh, w even if something is wrong, we want it to be consistent because we want somebody reading the article to not be distracted by those elements. 
Uh, we also have some less formal uh, systems in Python that have kind of created certain kinds of jargon, certain kinds of constructions that we can expect. So, for instance, many Python conferences and user groups include the city that they're located in in their organizational names. Uh, geography is a relatively easy way to disambiguate between different local communities um, from the larger community. Uh, we can tell that Pi Ladies Atlanta and Pi Ladies Santa Domingo are two separate groups just by looking at the name. It gets even easier because there are unique identifiers for different locations in the form of IATA codes. So IATA makes sure that uh, all airport codes are unique because there are some extremely important differences between Portland, Oregon and Portland, Maine. Um, my house is in Portland, Oregon. I want to make sure that I get home to the right Portland. So IATA has designated PDX as the code for Portland, Oregon, just so that we can all tell the difference. And these codes are super convenient. A lot of cities sort of adopt them as nicknames um, and uh, identifiers. But not all IATA codes are uh, intuitive. Chicago airports, um, Midway, O'Hare, uh, both have some uh, uh, IATA codes that don't reference Chicago in any way. Um, these departures from style, these sorts of inconsistencies, are the sort of thing that requires explanation uh, so that readers don't get distracted from the material that they're trying to learn while trying to figure out where the writer is from or a detail like that. And while I will always struggle to remember that both tickets to ORD and MDW will get me to Chicago, the sort of PY star prefix used in PyLadies has become an easy to remember signal that we're talking about Python. There are a variety of ways that PY has slid into Python project names and Python jargon. Uh, some projects have chosen words with, whose letters already include PY. Uh, pyramid is a word that already came with that Y equipped. But other uh, organizations have done things where they swap an I for a Y. So Project Jupiter, for instance, is spelled J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. That can be handy for disambiguation and for findability because it's a little bit different. People can uh, search for it a little bit more easily unless Google tries to be helpful and autocorrects things. There's also more than a few jokes about the word pie, as in the sweet dessert with a crust and filling that we might eat. Uh, cherry pie is an example that follows that naming schema. So a lot of projects also have developed their own internal naming schemas, which as we're writing, if we're writing about those specific projects, we have to be familiar with them. Beware, for instance, uses a combination of so many puns about uh, bees, mostly, and history occasionally, uh, to create descriptive names for their tools. So Beware has a subtitle that's very clever. The full name is Beware, colon, the IDEs of Python, as in the Ides of March, if you are a Julius Caesar fan? I mean, Shakespeare fan, maybe, I guess. It's been a while since Julius Caesar. Um, so they also <laughs> have a library named Toga, as in the sheet that Julius Caesar would wear, which provides wrappers. Bunch of nerds, all I'm saying. And of course, um, since beware is spelled B-E-E-ware, uh, the pre-validator is B4, B-E-E-4, -E two E's. So if it sounds like I'm saying a lot of names, that's because we name a lot of things. We name them pretty fast, too. Um, as technology moves forward, we are constantly having new things that we have to stick a name on. There, we're often moving fast enough that there are multiple projects sharing a name. 
So I think most of us in this room have probably heard of Django, the Python web-based framework. But there's also a piece of software out there named Django that's uh, for tablature for musicians. And while most of the search engine results have started being really good about finding the Python framework, sometimes if you search for things like Django software or Django themes for musicians, you wind up over at the tablature software instead. So these sorts of name collisions are annoying. Um, it, they are perhaps even like a full-on problem if you're trying to search online for help. Like how many times have each of us walked away from a meetup or a conference with like a module we know we want to look up when we get home and we're hoping that we remember the name or that our new contact or our new friend who introduced us to it will send us a link or maybe we'll be able to find it through a search engine. Unless you have a pretty good memory, which I don't, um, you're basically going to wind up just adding keywords to a search engine, like adding and removing words like you're creating the right incantation to summon this module. And um, that's not necessarily the most effective way to make sure that somebody finds your work. And if you're looking for Python modules to help you with herpetology research or the study of snakes, uh, you can't find them. I don't even know what to tell you about that, um, but it keeps getting more complicated because some herpetologists just named a species of Python after Monty Python. It's not, it's not going well there. Um, so these name collisions <laughs> just get more common. They are our future. The only way that we can write about them, the only way that we can make them accessible to people is to give context, to disambiguate. Unique identifiers are hard and we keep building new things that we have to come up with at least a somewhat unique identifier for. So that is both a pitfall for us, but also kind of an op opportunity because it gives us an idea of the things that have to be in whatever we're writing. All right, so I keep saying the word disambiguation, which is a very fancy word and very long, um, but it just basically means clarifying what you mean by a particular word or name. So for instance, if I'm talking about Python, I'll say Python the programming language, not the snake. Just like spelling out abbreviations, you usually only need to disambiguate terms once in a piece of writing. Um, if you're the sort of person who likes footnotes, that's a great use of footnotes. Uh, as we're writing about a programming language with multiple versions, disambiguation becomes even more important. Like I said, nobody enjoys getting halfway through a tutorial before realizing that they're using the wrong version of Python or <laughs> they don't have the right dependency or something like that. And once again, please, please, please note the version of Python you're using whenever you write about Python. I'm gonna say that at least a couple more times. Even if you assume that everybody you know is using Python 3, include that version number. Python 4 is kind of a glimmer in some people's eyes right now, but there are folks who are starting to talk about what might be included in that version. And similarly, there are not only people still using Python 2.7, there are people who are still using earlier versions than 2.7. They're not going to have support, but that doesn't, Oh, um, they're not necessarily going to have support after the end of life for 2.7, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. You had a question? Like that's certainly the ideal that we um, move people more towards Python 3 instead of writing about Python 2.7, but 
my experience has been that um, that that a lot of people, if they are still using 2.7, don't see that as a reason to give it up. Um, if they're using it, they're still they're using it for a reason usually. So we still have to, you know, keep them in mind as we're writing. I'm sorry, what was that? Um, we're going to talk about visuals a little bit, but I would not rely on just putting a logo um, because what if you have a reader who uses a screen reader or uses another piece of software or is on a really slow internet connection and can't load images? Um, I really recommend using the words and adding an image is great, but I wouldn't depend on that on its own. Mm hmm exactly. Absolutely. Um, and uh, that's, that's basically what I'm saying. Please just do that always, <laughs> always, always, always. All right, any other questions on that? Okay, great. Um, so a lot of writers like using dis uh, links for disambiguation. Um, and for the same reason that I'm not necessarily a fan of relying on images, I'm not necessarily a fan of relying on links for disambiguation. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Like I said, I've spent too much time in marketing and the idea in marketing is you never want to send somebody away from your website. Once you have them on your website, you wanna convince them to do whatever you're marketing to them. Um, but also because not everybody has the same internet experience as we do. So a lot of us, for instance, um, are probably used to pretty high-speed internet where we can access everything we need, we can download, we get all the images when we go to a new website, all of that sort of stuff. The only time most of us really worry about what we have to download in advance is for workshops. Like this conference Wi-Fi is not always the most dependable. But that's not a universal experience of the internet. In fact, it's not even probably the experience of most people outside of the US, Europe, and Australia. So I'm, I'm going to use one example that I know personally. Um, I know a Python uh, instructor who lives in Alaska. Um, I, a rural village on an island, he can work a little bit remotely using satellite internet um, but every time he leaves his hometown, he downloads packages, updates, books, movies, everything, because he basically can't get anything beyond a simple website. Um, in the state of Alaska, about 15% of households can't get internet faster than 10 megabits per second. You can technically watch Netflix with 10 megabits. It is not a good experience. Uh, some of those households, um, about 5% of households in Alaska can't get more than three megabits per second, which means a lot of modern websites with images, with animation, those sorts of things don't load at all. So we can assume that a lot of programmers will have pretty decent internet access, but we can't assume that everybody will. So, that's one of the reasons that links, images, um, relying on outside resources is not ideal. There are even Python programmers who do not have any internet access at all. There are programs um, in uh, California where a couple of Python programmers are working with uh, incarcerated students who do not have computers. They hand write out all of their code. Instructors print off tutorials and bring them in. So if they need to look at a link for something, they're gonna have to wait until next week when the instructor has printed off the link and brings that in next. 
Um, lastly, I don't entirely like links for disambiguation because links break. Um, even if you're really good about updating your content, maintaining it, link rot is a tough problem. Um, it just can uh, be difficult to notice, even if you have tools to catch broken links, because some sites will do redirects, some sites will just remove pages. Everybody does kind of what they want in that direction. I'm also not a huge fan of relying on search to provide context, um, both because not everybody will have a chance to search or the knowledge of how to Google particularly well. But it also does not always end well. I have seen readers Google um, for a fairly innocuous term and wind up on Urban Dictionary, uh, which has extremely non-professional definitions. And that's probably not somewhere we want to send people to learn from. All right. <clears throat> usually write in the paragraph. Just giving a little bit of context in the paragraph is usually enough. So for instance, if I was writing about, um, let's go with that herpetology example. It's not going to be easy to search for herpetology, um, but I would make sure that not only is the word herpetology in that, I would explain what herpetology is for anybody who lands on the page and doesn't know. I would also use terms like the study of snakes so that if somebody was uh, looking on uh, in terms of is, is searching for the s studying snakes or something like that, they get there. But then I'd also kind of point out the, the fact that this is a hard topic to disambiguate and make sure that people know what they're kind of getting themselves into. Thank you. No worries. All right. <clears throat> All right, clarity. So when we're writing about Python, especially in documentation, our goal is always writing as clearly as possible. With documentation in particular, if something isn't clear, if it isn't um, fairly easy to understand, that's where a lot of people will just stop following the tutorial. They might not finish the project, they might move on, they might consider a different piece of software, but that's kind of where we tend to lose people. So disambiguation is one of the keys to writing clearly about Python, but it's only one piece. Um, whether you're writing support documentation, whether you're writing tutorials, um, you want to sort of keep your eye out for a couple of key things that can make your, your information less clear. So one of those factors is tone. So if you have ever taken an English class, you have heard a lot about tone, but outside of that, it's not really that well known. The idea is that as you're writing, you have a voice. Your writing sounds like you in the way that uh, something written by somebody else will sound a little bit different. You have your own word choices, you have your own style. So within that voice, within that tone, we also kind of want to still stay consistent with the overall tone of other Python projects. We want to have um, a pretty obvious connection between Python and palettes and anything else you might be working with. So in terms of clarity, we're, or excuse me, in terms of tone, Python is kind of an informal community. Um, a lot of people will write their materials in the first person. We don't get too hung up on job titles as much as other communities will, those sorts of details. Um, when we're looking at something a little bit more uh, formal, we're still, we still sometimes slide in jokes. We still, you know, we make it look like Python. And that's great. That's something that's kind of sets us apart. However, if we're too informal, things become a little bit more difficult to understand. So the strategies for keeping sort of informality on a manageable level, uh, we wanna keep our sentences really short, um, especially like some people love a good compound sentence, a run-on sentence, anything like that. But 
especially with documentation, tutorials, we want short sentences because short sentences are clearer instructions. One step, one sentence. We also want to do some like basic grammar checks. We want to make sure that all of our verb tenses uh, match. So instead of saying Python 3 does this and then did this, we want it to be does and does or did and did. Um, we want to keep adverbs and adjectives to a minimum. Uh, they tend to bulk up con sentences, but they're also very distracting. We want to make sure that we have antecedents for everything. Antecedents are, um, if you have a pronoun, the antecedent is what the pronoun refers to. So, my name is Thursday, my pronouns are she and her. Those are pronouns. Um, we also want to avoid passive sentences. Uh, those are usually the longest sentences you'll have in your writing. Um, and passive sentences are kind of easy to uh, identify. Um, as you're writing, if you add the words by zombies to the end of the sentence, you can tell if it's passive, if it makes sense. So, for instance, the program was written to automate workflows. I can add by zombies to the end of it and still works. The program was written to automate workflows by zombies. That's a sentence that is grammatically totally correct. It's also very passive. Whereas if I said, I wrote the program to automate work workflows and then added by zombies, it would be, I wrote the program to automate workflows by zombies, which isn't a grammatically correct sentence. Though, you know, it has a zombie in it. All right, right. Um, I like zombies as a way to check for passivity because they look wrong in most sentences because we don't have a lot of zombies running around. Um, we also want to be confident in our writing. Even if you're not 100% sure, you don't want to go too far in using phrases like I think or probably or most likely. You want your readers to be confident in what you're telling them. They want to think that you're the expert, and because you know more than them, you are the expert. Wishy-washy language just gives people doubts on the usefulness of what they're reading. Uh, Claire? Um, so clarity um, can be measured as well. So you may see suggestions that documentation and other materials about technical topics should be written at an eighth grade reading level. Um, this isn't the best metric, but it's kind of the metric that we have at the moment. Uh, so basing our reading levels on an abstract idea of what an eighth grader in the US probably should be able to read, it doesn't tell us a lot for most audiences, but it gives us at least a number to look at. So <clears throat> there are a bunch of various tools that will give you this sort of evaluation of your work and tell you what grade level it's at. Um, Hemingway is one, a lot of word processors have one built in. Um, and they just go through and they analyze what you're writing. They look at things like the length of words you use, the length of sentences you use, um, whether you have a lot of adjectives, all that sort of stuff. These tools are very automated, so use them with a grain of salt. But in general, we don't want to score too high. Um, if we're scoring over 10, 11, or 12th grade, if it says that it's only accessible to college students, it really is more accessible to people who are expert level. Uh, so especially when we're writing for Pat or one of our newer personas, we want to keep it at a lower grade level, like the sixth to eighth grade. Um, for what it's worth, this talk scored closer to a 10th grade reading level, um, mostly because I use words like disambiguation and antecedents. Uh, technical terms and jargon are also often considered more advanced, which will push your score up, which is another reason to take it kind of with a grain of salt. Um, 
even if you contextualize it, systems get a, a little concerned. So consider these uh, reading levels sort of a rough guide. Just a couple more of these and then we get to do an exercise, I promise. Uh, findability is another factor uh, that we really want to prioritize. It's just as important in clarity. Uh, no matter what your use case is, people have to find your writing to be able to use it. Uh, so the question of findability does overlap a bit with uh, disambiguation. Um, if you just search for Python without any of the words uh, related to software, you might get the programming language, but you might also get papers about the use of oracle snakes in ancient Greece, um, which is a topic I'm fascinated by, but is not relevant to this. So for some people, findability is kind of equivalent to search engine optimization. Um, or SEO, and once again, this is like my marketing experience throwing in. Uh, SEO techniques are all about telling search engines how to find your material, um, and search engines remain important because even though our readers are, actu are actual humans, uh, most humans use search engines as their way to find information, even if they know where that information is. The number of people who go to Google and type in the uh, website for like their email address, and I have seen a programmer do this. This is not just like somebody's parents who are older. I have seen programmers do this. Um, it's pretty common, even though they know the, the website. So when we're talking about findability, we're also talking a little bit about whether people can find what they're looking for in the piece of information you're giving them. So if we're talking about a piece of documentation, most people are not going to read your entire documentation, everything you've ever written. They're looking for one small solution to their specific problem. So when they get to your documentation, they need to be able to find it. That might mean they're going to search within your documentation. It also probably means that they're going to skim the content. So as we're writing these things, we want to make them very skimmable. Um, this is sort of how humans uh, read most websites these days, looking at um, headlines and subheads, bullet points, uh, anything that is typeset differently, um, such as bold or italic, uh, and then short paragraphs um, are also things that people look for. They read those pieces rather than the whole piece to make sure that they're getting the information that they need. So, that might mean that you need a table of contents and an index, uh, depending on whether you're writing for print or screen, you might wanna uh, test some of the search functions on your documentation um, as you're writing it to make sure that it's still findable. And since this is Python, uh, lots of white space. Lots of white space is good for skimming and for writing Python. Um, we also want to do things like include error messages. So if somebody is trying to figure out a problem, they're probably going to just copy and paste the error message right into Google and see what pops up. And if you have a solution for that error message, but that error message isn't in the text of your documentation or article, it may not show up for people. So using the, the terms that they're looking for is super important. Um, we also want to differentiate code samples when we're writing for people who skim. Um, Python code is, of course, more human readable than average, um, but we want to make sure that it is visibly different from the pros that we're offering. So a lot of people use monospace fonts, uh, indents, whatever makes sense to make sure that it's visibly different. Um, lastly, we just want to make sure that we're as consistent as possible with how terms are used outside of our writing. So like making sure we use brand names correctly, um, getting spelling right, that sort of thing. Um, I really also want to say please don't create your own abbreviations that are different than other people's abbreviations because that happens a lot too and it's very confusing and if you're just making an abbreviation for just one article, 
it's okay to spell out the whole word. We're on the internet. We have extra characters. Okay, trustworthiness. <clears throat> so, not all writers are trustworthy. And I'm not saying that we're a bunch of scammers. Um, rather, I'm saying that a lot of writers don't uh, build trust with readers. They fail to earn the trust of their readers. So how do we earn trust? First of all, we have to respect the reader. We can't patronize or talk down to readers because we'll lose them. Uh, we want, you know, to be talked, we want to talk to readers the same way we want people to talk to us. We want that kind of respect. We also want to respect the community. Um, the Python community can feel really huge, but it's really quite tiny, especially when we consider how interconnected it is. Um, none of us are going to know every other single Python user in the world, but I'll guarantee that most of us are familiar with the same authors, the same speakers, the same leaders. Uh, we do want to keep to that informal tone because people do tend to respond better to informal tones, especially if they are reading something written by an individual rather than a company. Um, and a surprising number of programmers don't put their names on things. There are loads of software consultancy websites out there who I could not tell you who is the programmer behind them. There's no name, there's no picture, no nothing. And that's, that's a really hard position to be in if you want to build trust because people don't see the human behind the organization. Um, a little bit of personalization can also be useful. It helps convince readers that not only do you know what you're writing about, you're an actual human. This isn't like generated by some content farm. Um, you also uh, want to include images if you have any. So I did just talk to you all about how images aren't something to necessarily rely on, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use them. If you have images, you absolutely want to include them because uh, there are numerous studies that people respond much better to images than to the written word. Uh, with that in mind, please do not just put a photo with a pair of hands on a keyboard. I invented that in like 2004. We can move past that and do better images. Um, <clears throat> we also want to avoid obsolete terms. Technology moves very fast, and outdated material isn't trustworthy. Um, if somebody realizes that there's some documentation rot going on on a website, they're not going to trust any of the material on that website. They're going to assume that everything is outdated. Uh, we also want to talk about obsolescence outside of strictly technical terms. So the Python community has mostly rejected terminology like master and slave. I don't want to rehash that whole argument here, but there are two points that I want to highlight. Whether or not you feel personally comfortable using terminology like this, there are people who experience pain when they have to use terms that remind them of terrible experiences. Furthermore, slavery still exists today, and diluting the meaning of a word like slave can make it harder to work against the end of that sort of practice. Second, language changes constantly. We should always be expecting more changes. Consider the word literally for a moment. When I tell you that I am literally freezing, you know that I'm cold, but am I actually literally experiencing a concerning drop in my core temperature? Like, actually freezing, not so much. And despite my own feelings on the developing interchangeability of the words literally and figuratively, and oh, I have some opinions, the reality is that we haven't just suddenly all agreed to switch the meaning of a word out of nowhere. Different communities use different words in different ways. Language grows, language changes, uh, especially as we're trying to cover new concepts that we may not already have language for like how the word computer used to refer to a person who was making calculations, but now refers to a whole range of devices. These changes are pretty routine, whether through conversation, slang, academic use, memes, translation, um, any time that we communicate, these changes happen. 
English is particularly notorious for these changes. Um, English has a reputation for rifling through other languages, pockets, and stealing nouns, which can <laughs> make the language evolution even a little bit more complicated. Trying to stop this sort of growth of language is like shouting into the wind. Even if it makes you feel better, it's not going to be effective at stopping the change. And honestly, a lot of attempts to control language come with some elitist and biased crap behind them. Um, the history of the word ain't is basically a primer on classism and language. So instead, you really want to think about how you can stay up to date on how language is being used in the Python community. And the easiest way to do that is reading widely within the community and see how other people are talking about Python. And as you see changes, you want to update your, your past writing so that it remains trustworthy, so that it remains up to date. All right, so we covered a lot there. But now we're going to talk about how this really actually applies when we pull out our pen and paper. So a ton of information that I've just thrown at you. Um, and I'm a professional writer. I don't keep all of those considerations in my head. I can't. If I'm writing, I'm focused on writing. But since we live in the future, we don't have to memorize this stuff. Uh, we can use checklists instead. And this is actually a checklist that I use, um, specifically for Python projects. Um, I write an outline, and then I check this list. I write an incredibly bad first draft, and then I check this list. I write another draft after I show it to somebody and improve some things, and I check this list again. I check it over and over again because I, I want to make sure that I don't edit out something that is necessary. Um, I don't want to make sure I want to make sure that I don't make changes that violate one of these rules along the way. So these checklists help us catch the potential issues that we've been discussing before they can turn into real problems. So in case I haven't said it enough yet, Python version numbers. Um, we also are shooting for roughly an eighth grade reading level. If you find another metric you want to use, go for it. There's just not a lot of metrics that are easily accessible for uh, writing complexity. We want to make sure that we've got up-to-date tech references. Um, pro tip, if you ever work on a project for more than a couple of months, you will have to like check for those tech references again and again um, because they may not stay the same over the months of the project. So with the Python style supplement, when I started writing it, there was an entirely different governance structure for this language, which I then had to update as we were moving on. We also want to get rid of any of our passive zombies, um, unattended antecedents, so antecedents without pronouns, or excuse me, antecedents, uh, pronouns without nouns. Uh, we want to make sure that we've got a consistent style, um, whether we're referring to brand uh, names, sharing code samples, no matter what we do, we just want to be consistent with it throughout the whole piece. We also want to eliminate huge blocks of text. We want to have that white space so that people can uh, skim where possible. We want to have those uh, visuals. And then we also want to eliminate any wishy-washy language. Uh, your, your experts be confident in your knowledge. So now, we are going to look at an actual article that I think is written pretty well. And I'm going to hand that out whenever I find the bottom of the pie. but we should have enough copies for everyone to share. Okay, so I'm also going to pull this up here so that we can all look at the same thing. 
Um, so I'm going to give everybody a minute or two to actually read through this, and then we're going to talk about what it does well. So just take a minute, and then we will start talking. Are we short back there? How many are we short? Two or three. Two or three. Can I persuade a couple of people up front to share? Everybody has at least a copy to share back there, but you're welcome to take it back. Absolutely. Um, like the organization behind it is more long lived than a lot of website maintainers are. <laughs> um, I would still like be specific about what you're li linking to. I wouldn't just say here and link here to it though. I would say this is the package I'm linking to. All right. Has everybody had a chance to at least skim a little bit? Does anybody need more time? Okay, so this is, this is a pretty decent article about Python packaging. Um, I'm going to admit that this is kind of a trick because I don't think there is any version number mentioned in this article, but because of the topic that it's talking about, the version number is a little less necessary, though I would still email the person who wrote it and ask them to put it in. Um, but let's talk about what works well here. So we have some pretty good explanations here. Let's see. So here they're talking about what people will think in terms of release 
versions rather than like specific distributions. And we don't even really necessarily need to know exactly in this context what they mean because they go through examples that explain what they mean. So they're disambiguating um, what these terms might be used for elsewhere because not every single community uses release versions or distributions in exactly the same way. So they explain it. Um, they also, I don't know if you can tell on the screen, but you can see that uh, on the paper that PIP is in a monospace font. So they made the choice that in addition to code samples, they're going to monospace um, anything that basically you're going to put into the command line. I like that approach. Some people feel that it's a little bit difficult, um, especially to make sure that like when you copy and paste, your styles don't change. But I think it's a really good visual indicator. So are there any um, pieces of this that might be really good for skimmability? Yes, bullet points. I, I may have cheated a little bit. Um, these paragraphs are kind of about as long as you would want to go in this situation, but they've made it more skimmable by breaking things up into uh, bullet points here. They also have given us like this very skimmable conclusion. And a lot of programmers are like people who read novels and skip to the end. Um, they'll just read the conclusion and then just go back up to the top if it's the piece that they want. Um, there are a few things that I'm less excited about here. Uh, they've got, um, they mention things like PyDist, but don't give any definition for it or any context. But overall, it's a pretty, pretty good article. Um, so is there anything in here that anybody saw that was confusing? Yeah. Yes, they, they did not, there are some typos in here. I did not correct these typos. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's something that at, it, during your editing process, you would go through and you would check those pieces to make sure that they're correct. Any other uh, questions about this article or issues that you see? Absolutely. Um, with this sort of uh, article, I think that what you're pointing out about the said file is particularly important because that's a construction that, it's what I would call a fancy construction. Like it's not something that everybody would use every day in their writing. So not every reader would move smoothly over it. And yeah, we definitely have an opportunity to make more bullet points here. Um, Yeah, I think that that would be definitely a great improvement. Um, who do you think is the persona, the audience for this article? You, you already got partway there with um, knowing what package managers are. Would you say that's a skill that, or a topic that a newer programmer would be familiar with or just a more experienced one? Yeah. So yeah, this is probably aimed more at our Piper, uh, our more senior developer than a newer developer. Um, if it was for a newer developer, we would want to see a lot more context. We would want to see a lot more explanation. 
But for somebody who has a good working knowledge, um, this is very accessible. I think that even our uh, expert in another language dev would find this material pretty easy to go through and make use of. We're, we're coming back. We're, so the checklist is for us, but the readers are for other, are other people. So we're going to talk about other people in a minute. Yeah? Absolutely. Um, this, this could be a case for footnotes even. Um, if you wanted to footnote some of the um, abbreviations to make sure it's clear or spell it out in line. Both are perfectly reasonable approaches to this sort of uh, question. All right. Let's, uh, come on. Sorry, I have to get my notes back now. All my super secret notes you get to see. All right, so we are 10 minutes to the break and I have a bad example for us to look at and I realize that the stack is even smaller than the other one so I definitely don't have enough copies. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand it out and between now and the end of the break, if everybody can get a chance to look at one of these copies, um, we will discuss this article after we come back from the break. So I'm gonna put the checklist back up um, and I'd like everybody to try to find three things in here which violate that checklist and figure out how you would fix them in your experience. Cool? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so this article may, may be a little bit more controversial. Um, it's also a little bit longer, so there's two pages to that. Um, so if everybody wants to just like team up and share a copy, that'd be great. Um, this one is about page, this one is about page. This, this is a comparison of uh, PHP and Python. It's two pages? Yes, it's two pages. So I am confident you will find a lot of errors in this article. This is as it run, ran online, by the way. <laughs> um, but the one thing that I don't necessarily want to talk about is whether or not PHP or Python is better. Let us assume that the writer is trying to make that point and we don't have to argue that point with them. <laughs> Um, I can also make this available online if anybody wants to read it online. So here's our checklist again. And I will wander around if anybody has questions, please feel free to ask them. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that right now. No problem.
Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So in five minutes, uh, we will all head out for snack break. And once again, we'll discuss when we come back. But five minutes to snack break. Okay, uh, there's now a version up at the spill link as well. So if anybody wants to read. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, there was a slash missing, but let me. Of course it doesn't work because why should anything be easy when you are doing it live during a presentation? Great. Sorry about that. Give me one more second. That is working when I test it, so. Oh, it is three o'clock if folks want to get snacks. Um, and then we'll just meet back here and 
keep going. I think the snack break is like 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long. Um, so I think if everybody is back here in 15 minutes, we'll be good to go. And we will jump right into talking about this article. Um, I've written some blog posts. Um, I was talking a couple of years ago about a WordPress book, but I don't like WordPress enough to write a book about it. So, oh, there are there are a few people who love it to pieces. I mean, WordPress is what kind of got me into programming because screen around under the hood is a good way to learn to program, but. So have you heard like the number, uh, the percentage of the web that runs on WordPress? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a third of the web supposedly runs on WordPress and Um, so that that one, there was a 2018 update to that number, and it was still about a third. Wow. So. That's surprising. I mean, for people's first websites, it's
Google's good enough to like they like figure it out and know what I mean. So Google doesn't even use the meta tags anymore usually, from what I understand. Oh, they still obey the robots one. They obey the robots one, but like they don't take it into account in the same way that they used to for calculating rankings. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a secret sauce. We don't 100% know what they use, but the thing that seems to be the biggest factor is if you have links from other sites. Okay. Um, but the thing about like writing about technical topics is a lot of the stuff that we write is so specific <laughs> that um, we're not competing for that many keywords that people are using. Like, so if you're trying to sell a product, um, it's a little bit different, but if you are writing documentation, or you're writing a personal blog, or you're writing um, more for a, more for anybody who isn't Darby the decision maker, yeah. um, the SEO isn't going to be a big priority. It's um, much more about like making sure that it's a good resource and then telling some actual humans yeah. about it. That's what I'm trying to use Twitter and find things to do to just get it out there. My friend Ken writes has like retweeted some stuff, which he has a lot of followers, so mm -hmm. I'm sure gets a pretty big yeah. impact. But I'm still trying to find that way of like being that resource or mm -hmm. just like find more content to write about or I don't know, something. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, definitely the more that you can write, the, the faster that it builds up. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about repurposing some of the content you may have already written. So you enlighten me that I shouldn't just just because I know how to do something doesn't mean that other people don't know how to do it. Yes. And if I can do it, I should write a post about it. So I'm Absolutely. Like, yeah. So far I've been like not doing that. Like I don't feel like I know how to do a list comprehension. Why do I need to do it? But so one of my problems for writing this workshop was, oh, everybody already knows how to write. I can't. And then like I made the outline and I talked to some folks and they're like, no, this is yeah. this is a thing I haven't. Yeah, no, I saw this on the PyCon forum on the website, and I was like, oh, okay, registered, definitely, right there. So, yeah. Um, oh, well, thank you for bringing this talk on. Definitely. I think it really helps me. I'm glad to hear that. It's very, like, the thing about giving talks is, like, everybody has, like, a very serious face the whole time, so it's very hard to judge, like. Yeah. I can imagine. I'm trying to attend my first regional talk at Pi Colorado. Oh, very cool. Are you in Colorado? Or? Yeah, I live in Colorado. So oh. I'm one of the organizers of Pi Colorado. Wh when is it? <coughs> it is September 7th through 9th, so it's a weekend. So and my family's all in Colorado Springs and Denver, and yeah. I only like going to Colorado when I have some excuse not to yeah. spend too much time with them. Pi Colorado, we're accepting okay. talks right now at papercall.io. Um, I don't know if you know Scott Vitale or Frank uh, Marcel. Actually, his partner is uh, talking tomorrow, uh, Emily. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Marcel. Mm -hmm. She's doing a talk on regression testing, which I'm also going to. Very cool. Um, but yeah, her uh, partner and I are doing planning Pi Colorado, which is going to be our first regional conference. Um, so, yeah, Denver, Colorado Springs? Denver, Denver. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're trying to get Denver, Colorado Springs, Denver to kind of come together. And uh, also some people from Wyoming, Nebraska, because they don't have any resources out there. You know, so. um, but yeah. Um, I can uh, send you over if you have any talk suggestions. We're looking for speakers right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, doing either just like actual like keynote, or I think we have a keynote speaker, but we're still looking for, you know, just other talks and stuff like that. So, okay, cool. Yeah. It'll I be will really take cool. a look and see if I have anything relevant. To also, we'd just love to have you just attend if you wanted to just be, a, be an attendee. So, yeah. I have to check who's getting married when in my family to go. figure out my schedule. Yeah, that's so important. People getting married just that was a real wrench in my oh, schedule. They have to celebrate their love. Oh, so gosh. gross. So much feelings. I know. Feelings are annoying. I just want to program it. <laughs> exactly. How are we doing for time?
have just about everybody back. So yeah, let's let's get started talking about PHP and Python. All right, let's pull up. So was this a uh, I am pretty sure this person actually got paid to write this for a freelance position, which the world is a cruel, cruel place, especially to people who care about writing. Erin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like it looks like they tried to make it more skimmable, like the um, paragraphs are very short, there's lots of headers, but the, the headers are basically parts of the paragraphs. So that's, that's definitely an issue. Anybody else spot something? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to tell what audience they think they're writing for. Um, like, this, this is a question that I would think most beginner programmers would have. Like, what's the first programming language you should really put a lot of effort to? But it doesn't necessarily give enough context for one of our um, uh, beginner programmer personas. There's, there's just not enough information. I'm going to, oh, you have a follow-up? Oh, yeah. So that's a really good question, whether or not bias adds tone. Um, bias does definitely uh, have a connection to tone. You do want to bring your opinions to a piece, your experience. But this, this definitely is going too far in bias, in my opinion. If it reads like an ad, just like you said, it feels like an ad. And this definitely um, feels like something that somebody wrote just to put their opinion out there and, you know, make an article without necessarily having a plan behind it. Any other errors that, in the back? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's almost like they needed to hit some sort of word count and pad it just like we might have done in high school or something. Yeah. get rid of the first two-thirds of this article and still have roughly the same piece of communication. <laughs> yeah? So the popularity section, um, well, there's, so there's no visualizations at all, right? But then in the popularity section, where you, uh, you could easily put a visualization talking about um, just somehow, some method of comparing the usage of PHP and Python or something beyond just saying the neck to neck. Right. Yeah, it's, it's not even clear like what version we're talking about if maybe a newer version of PHP is more competitive to Python or vice versa. Yeah. Aaron? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, I consider this kind of the prose version of, just read the code, it's fine, you can do that. Like it's not giving the context for the decision or anything. Yeah, this this never saw an edi editor. No. Just got tossed up. And there's also a one enough sort of uh, enough grammar mistakes to be very distracting. And also a bunch of inconsistent metaphors. And of course, pausing in whatever happens to be mm -hmm. And and metaphors is is kind of, um, they're kind of interesting, right? Because a lot of our metaphors are really rooted in our own experiences. I'm not 100% sure like what this person's experiences is, are from the metaphors. Like they just don't quite work. When I read something that suffers from that problem, uh, it's usually because it was a person who was first writing the grammar, who was written it. Yeah, um, so people who are writing with English as their uh, second language will have some definite, um, will be more likely to have some metaphor questions. Why do you want to have someone read it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would also say that um, there are a lot of varieties of English and idioms are different in different varieties of English. So it's not just a question of whether somebody speaks English as their first or second language. It's kind of a question of which English that they speak. Um, for that reason, I'm kind of in favor of not putting too many metaphors. The more precise your description rather than metaphorical, at least on a technical topic, probably the clearer you're going to be. I saw your hand, I think. Yeah, so that's very true. Most projects do not have a lot of support for folks who don't speak English as their first language who want to contribute on a writing level. Um, like this is kind of one of my issues with open source is that we talk a lot about like code reviews and making sure our code is great, but we don't mirror that with like documentation reviews on the same level or editing one another's work or supporting the, the pieces of an open source project that aren't just code. I think Python is maybe a little bit better than some communities about that, but getting an open source project to like designate uh, documentation as like a requirement for a library before it can um, be, re be released is a really tough argument to make to most communities. So he, the thing I would say first about technical writing is that sometimes it's allowed to be boring. Sometimes the information that you're conveying is more important than making everybody, like I think I'm the only person I know who reads documentation for fun. Like nobody does that, so. <laughs> 
Also, if you get really bored and want a great piece of uh, documentation to read, MailChimps is worth reading just straight through. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, because it has these qualities? Yeah. So it's, it's globally minded. Um, you won't see a lot of metaphors. Um, the metaphors that you'll see are more related to things that are a little bit more global. So like food is a good one. Most people have to eat. Um, whereas uh, pop culture is tough. Um, anything revolving around like mechanical skills is like, I've seen a lot of, this is just like the carburetor in a car. I'm sorry, I couldn't point out a carburetor if you paid me to. Um, hmm? I wouldn't even know. <laughs> Um, I would also say that a lot of metaphors have context that if you really want to use them, you can explain the context. But I would be very careful about metaphors that have cultural elements. I, one of my pet peeves is actually um, the metaphor to open the kimono. Um, I think it is a terrible metaphor, and I hear it especially from like salespeople, but I've heard it other places. Like it's the idea of like drawing back the curtain, which is much less offensive. Um, I do have a friend who responded to uh, somebody telling her that with asking if they wanted to take off their shirt to explain it to her. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't use certain metaphors as a result. It's okay to be boring. It is absolutely okay to be boring. That's kind of a complicated question. Right. So I would say that right now, um, you're going to be seeing more things in English than any other language. So for Python in particular, um, there are some folks writing in Spanish. I've seen some German, and I think some Chinese, Mandarin, um, but not a lot else. And part of that, I think, is because English has sort of become this common language for most programming communities, but it's also because there's not necessarily support to create materials in other languages. Um, like a lot of technical translators that I know who have translated documentation are doing this work on their own time. It's open source, um, which is great. I'm very glad that people are willing to put in time, but translation is one of those places that if you are able to throw some resources at it, it moves a lot faster and it moves a lot easier. Um, I do think that we're going to see English continue to be the main language for quite a while when it comes to programming. Personally, though, I think there's a lot of value in exploring um, other languages and how they would impact programming. Um, there's currently only one programming language that reads right to left instead of left to right. And it kind of astounds me that there's only one because it does make you think about things a little bit different if you're like changing things up, if you use a different language. Um, not all languages have the same concepts, the same terminology. Though English is very willing to steal those words off of anybody else, so as a result. I mean, English isn't, English isn't one language. It's like three languages stacked in a trench coat trying to get into a movie. There's, there's just so much going on. All right, any other thoughts on this article? So, yeah, yeah. So um, I do think this article uses both 
um, terms and spellings that are found in American English and British English, I don't think that it matters which one you go with as long as you're consistent. It's the consistency that makes it noticeably problematic rather than which choice it could have been. So, I mean, you say that it's nitpicky, but little details like consistency completely change the experience somebody has. So I think that this is one of those cases where being detail-oriented is really valuable. Anybody else? Good? All right. Sorry, this is, there we go. All right, so on this article, if some poor, poor editor had had to go through it, a lot of the errors that we looked at probably wouldn't have made it through, at least anything like a run-on sentence, a typo, that sort of stuff. But the reality is that a lot of us don't have access to an editor. We're usually responsible for editing our own work. Um, in open source, that might be because there aren't a lot of people who do documentation or have the skill set to edit with you. Um, in companies, it just might be because there's not budget to bring in anybody else. Um, so self-editing, while it is not enough to do all of your editing, um, Sometimes we have to pretend that it's uh, a good solution. Um, so when we don't have money for editors, how can we edit our, oh, ah, sorry about that. How can we edit our work? Uh, it's as simple as asking somebody, anybody, to read your piece. And I say anybody. I don't necessarily mean anybody off the street. But anybody who can give it a once over, even if they're not an expert, is better than having nobody at all look at it. Um, you want to build kind of a list of people you can convince to read things, um, people that you can trust, people who maybe have different experiences than you and will catch things you can't. Um, and there are often people who have to be comfortable working for free. Not everybody can, and if they can't, that's okay. Um, out of the types, out of all of your readers, you want to look for three specific types of readers. Uh, the first is diversity and sensitivity. So sensitivity to readers is actually a practice out of fiction writing where writers can get specific feedback when they're writing about uh, people or cultures outside of their own experience. Uh, but sensitivity reading is not just for fiction. Uh, it's a really easy way to get feedback on issues that you may not even exist. So for instance, until I had worked with an editor of color, I hadn't really noticed how often we code black as bad, um, such as blacklist or black hat. And that might seem like a very small detail, but it can still uh, be very hugely impactful on the sort of people who feel comfortable in our community. If we're constantly coding black as bad, uh, people who come from um, that background may not feel comfortable or may actively leave the community. So we also want to talk about um, having somebody read as an accessibility reader or a test reader. So this, the process of uh, publishing is kind of complicated. Um, that you have to write the thing, you have to put the thing up, you have to hope that people can see the thing once it's up. And if it's online, it's not always as simple as just putting it up and hoping that people can use the information. So we've talked a little bit about how slow internet connections can make writing inaccessible, but there's a bunch of other layers of accessibility to look at. Um, so I just finished a project where I needed to ensure that readers with visual disabilities could fully access all materials. And in print, that means things like using larger type, using specialized typefaces. But in digital format, that means making sure that your material works with screen readers, which is a whole nother device than you might usually be working for. Um, so the only way to really check 
if something is accessible by a screen reader is to look at it as, on a screen reader. If you don't have one, asking somebody with a screen reader is the closest you can get. I'd also recommend actually asking people with multiple devices because different screen readers behave in different ways and none of them are easy to work with. Uh, lastly, you're gonna want to look at uh, usability and technical readers. So having someone who has equal or greater Python experience to yourself review your uh, piece for technical accuracy is a good idea. Um, but I'd also suggest consider bringing in readers who are less experienced, uh, even sometimes bringing in non-programmers to read programming materials. I have noticed that people who don't necessarily have a programming background are often better at catching typos because it's the only thing that they're really connecting with. So it can be a faster way to catch some of those typos. Um, also, they can spot some kinds of errors because they don't have implicit knowledge. So implicit knowledge is all the stuff that we assume somebody knows. So for our different personas, Piper's uh, the more senior um, developer, we assume that they have implicit knowledge about JavaScript, about Python, about different libraries. So you want somebody who doesn't have that impl implicit knowledge because they'll spot issues. A person with a little distance from the project is always nice, uh, especially um, when the, you have jokes to test, because if your jokes rely on insider knowledge, somebody who's not an insider is the only one who's going to notice. Um, I'd also suggest that since we are talking about situations when you may not have access to an editor, um, especially if you need somebody who might not have the same programming experience, you have family members. And if they're asking you for tech support on their computers, you can ask them to read articles in exchange. Uh, I would suggest that um, only using one or two family members because they probably do have very similar experiences to you if they're related to you. Um, so you, do, you don't want to rely entirely on family. But you know, they're handy. Uh, you also want to see if you can get one of your stakeholders to read it. Um, even outside of commercial projects, uh, most projects have certain stakeholders. So those are the people who might be making decisions, might be most affected by uh, the project um, going in a certain direction, uh, all of those pieces. So depending on your project, stakeholders could be employers, they could be lawyers, they could be project contributors, they could be users, kind of depends on the situation, but having their feedback early enough in the process to address it or ignore it is really useful. And stakeholders are probably the only people who can give you feedback that I would say is a little bit more ignorable. I mean, you have to make them happy, but you don't have to write to their specifications. Um, let, Lastly, if you do have some resources, it is worth paying an editor. Um, a lot of editors may be priced lower than you think. Um, I work with a lot of people on a per piece basis. But more importantly, uh, paying an editor is almost always cheaper than correcting a mistake. Um, and also a lot of editors aren't in a financial position to contribute to open source for free. So money is the best way to get them involved. I mean, on average, an editor isn't going to make anything near a programmer's salary, so. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've also had some success getting other people who are writing about similar things to create sort of editing round robins where somebody hands me something I, I edit, and I hand something else to the next person, and we just go around in a circle. Um, Often that'll be a little bit insular as well, so you do want to branch out from that. But for something like writing resumes or writing short blog posts, just having a group of people that routinely give you feedback can be really useful. Uh, you also want to give yourself time to go through those edits and those critiques. Uh, this, is, this is something like I'm still working on and I've been writing for 15 years, 
getting a critique about your writing feels super personal because this is your writing. You have put it out into the world and hopefully everybody loves it. And not everybody will love it. Your readers, your editors, people who can give you criticism, they are on your side. It may not feel like that when you first look at those edits, but once you've had a little time to sit with them, um, it's a little bit easier to implement suggestions without getting caught up in anything emotional about your personal value and this article and feelings. Taking criticism is as much of a skill as giving criticism, so give yourself some time to work with the, the feedback that you get. You also will benefit from having like a day away from your work. Anytime you can step away for a little while, you'll see things differently when you come back, if only because you'll notice typos in a different way. Okay, so this part of uh, the workshop, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to be really effectively lazy. Um, I am probably the laziest writer you know. That doesn't mean I don't write a lot, it's just I don't want to do more work than I have to, which I think is a pretty standard programmer mindset. So there are a lot of tools out there. Um, a few folks have mentioned like automated documentation tools, um, but there's, there's a couple of other tools I want to talk about first. The best editing tools are the ones that have been in use for a while. So style guides, for instance, are a fairly well-established tool. Style guides started out in newspapers covering details like how big a headline should be and how to correctly refer to government officials. Designers have used style guides uh, to talk about details like what colors are in a company logo or reusable style elements. Developers have style guides. We mentioned PEP8 already. But for writers, style guides are a little bit different. We're, we're looking specifically at things like how do we disambiguate specific terms? Um, how do we make sure that we are getting all those weird camel case uh, names correctly capitalized? Those sorts of details. And we have a lot of options. So my first love was the AP style book because I came up through journalism journalism school, worked at daily paper, that sort of thing. And it's used by a lot of newspapers and other print media, but it's also used by a lot of websites. Uh, there's also a lot of technically specific um, style guides. So I mentioned that I've made one about um, Python, but a lot of communities have their own as well. Red Hat has one, Microsoft has their own. There's a bunch of these style guides out there. And because of that, I'm gonna encourage you to have more than one style guide at your fingertips. You should have more than one style guide because there's the question of graceful deprecation. A style guide that is specifically about Python is not going to cover anything else. So if you want to write about open source more generally, you might need a style guide that covers open source more generally. You might also wanna have something uh, that's more general I like the AP style book or the Chicago manual of style, both of which have online components. Um, but there's a wealth out there. So <clears throat> you can also build internal style guides, which is actually what the Python style supplement started as. I kept making mistakes, so I wrote them down so I wouldn't make them again. And that's basically what a style guide is. If you just open up a file and start writing your own, it's officially a style guide. It doesn't need some style guide stamp of approval. Style guides are also very regularly updated. Um, the AP style book updates every year. Most people don't buy every year, but every couple of years is usually enough to stay in sync with a more general style guide. For technical style guides, it can be a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> some update regularly, some don't. <coughs> Sorry about that. There are also loads and loads and loads of startups who are very excited to offer you some sort of cutting edge tool, whether it's for documentation or editing or grammar. 
Um, Grammarly and Hemingway are two that are used a lot for prose. Uh, Hemingway is a <laughs> um, web app that analyzes your writing based on rules that Ernest Hemingway set out. Um, and leaving aside all of his many other issues, Hemingway was a decent writer, but not everyone writes like Hemingway, and Hemingway's style doesn't fit all use cases. So <clears throat> we don't necessarily want to go completely with their suggestions. <coughs> Sorry. Hmm. Some of these tools even have some pretty dangerous flaws. Tools like Grammarly work by tracking everything you type. Uh, it's a keylogger. It's a keylogger with a real nice logo, but it's a keylogger. Uh, by default, um, the, the browser plugin sees everything. I like Grammarly, I think it's a good tool, and I still use it, but I don't keep the browser plugin constantly active because I don't entirely trust it. A lot of automated tools that are fairly new will have kinks like this. And the, the thing to remember is that the tool isn't ever going to be able to make the decision for you. So you're one, the one assessing the feedback and deciding whether or not to incorporate it, just the same way that you assess feedback from a reader or an editor. <coughs> So similarly, there are a lot of writing tools. Writing is a little bit harder to automate compared to editing. There's a lot of uh, individual pieces that you have to make decisions about, like what word choices, where do you think there are going to be issues? But there are some tools that are really, really effective. Templates in general are one of the best tools I've ever found for speeding up my writing process. And just to disambiguate, I'm talking about written templates, documents with blanks we can fill in, like Mad Libs, rather than templating agent, excuse me, templating engines and uh, technical tools like that. There are some tools like Text Expander, which can be used to fill in pre-existing templates, but a lot of writing templates are just always going to be text documents with sections where you can put your own materials. I do a lot of templated writing because I do a lot of writing that has consistency or similar structure. So tutorials, for example, are really good places to use templates because every tutorial is going to need an explanation at the top. It's going to need you to tell people what de dependencies you have, what versions you're using, and then you're just going to have step by step. You might have a conclusion at the end, but most tutorials are gonna look very similar. For blog posts, uh, it might be a little bit more complex if you're doing more freeform. Oh, thank you. Uh, so with a blog post, usually you wanna end with something that inspires the reader to take action, a, a, a call to action for, is uh, what it's often called. So calls to action are something else that's pretty easy to template. My template for calls to action is just three words. It's do the thing. I know that I have to give my readers a concrete action. I don't know what it is going to be when I, when I sit down for a new article, but I always know that it is going to have a verb and it is going to have a noun because it is a full sentence. So just putting do the thing and filling in what verb and noun later is good enough for a template. Uh, most of my, most templates aren't, they don't start life as templates. It's when you keep having to do similar things and you keep using the same material just as libraries are built when you keep having the same problem and you don't want to keep writing code to solve the same problem in different ways. So before I start a new project, I rummage through all my past projects for similar pieces. I find something that I might be able to use as a template, delete all the bits I don't need, and refill it. And if I find it particularly useful, I might clean it up and save it with the rest of my templates. Any piece that you've already written can be a template. And any piece that anybody else has written can be a template as well. 
As long as you're not using their words verbatim, their structure can be an inspiration to you. You can use it as a starting point rather than having to start from a blank page. And blank pages are, they're terrifying. I never want to start with a blank page if I can at least get a template or an outline or something on there. There are a lot of technical tools for writing as well. Word processors are, of course, a standard tool. Um, writing tools beyond that are kind of like time management apps. Anybody who has the power to make one that follows their very precise writing workflow probably has. That does mean that some writing apps don't work as well for everybody. Um, and the, honestly, the only way that you can find out is by testing them out. Uh, Scrivener, for instance, is a big fan favorite for writing long documents, especially like book projects. It's got a slew of features like keeping track of your references, um, helping you out if you want to reorganize all your content, and things like that. It's an amazing piece of software, and I can't use it. My workflow doesn't follow that workflow, so I have uh, moved on to tools that do match my workflow. So one of the reasons that um, Scribner isn't necessarily the best fit for me is because I don't do a strictly outlined approach. Scribner assumes that you're going to. I'm more the just brain dump everything onto a page and just get that really dirty, awful first draft done. Um, my first drafts are probably where I had the most fun writing, like the first draft for this uh, workshop was well, just a full page of put the version number, but then like some other stuff, um, some profanity, some jokes that did not make it into the talk. But because I had this massive brain dump, I had a starting point that didn't really need an outline. The thing is though, that writing workflows are intensely personal. Until you've spent some time writing, you're not going to know that much about your own workflow. You're not going to know which tools make things easier on you. So the way to really learn about where you can speed up your workflow or what tools you can use is to write a bunch and to just pay attention to whether outlines seem to work for you or whether brain dumps seem to work with you. If there's a particular point in your process where you know that you want feedback, those sorts of pieces of your workflow only come with experience. So we're gonna talk about this template right here. This is my template for lightning talks. Um, I, or excuse me, lightning talk proposals. I've run lightning talk submissions at a couple of conferences um, and I give lightning talks pretty regularly so I just kept having to write the same things so I made it into a template. This template covers most of the information you can be asked for when prepping a lightning talk. It's not universal, different events will have different requirements, but just about every form I've seen will have most of these elements. This will get you through filling it out. So talk proposals are interesting because they have to be persuasive to an audience that is not necessarily your final audience. So for a talk proposal for a lightning talk, you have to convince the person who is selecting talks long before you'll ever talk to the audience. So as we fill out this template, we want to keep that audience in mind rather than the people who will be listening to the talk. When you are ready to write the talk, that's when you get to think about that audience. So let's go over this in a little bit more detail and then I'm going to give all of us a few minutes to use this template to write our own proposals. So name and email address. In my version of the template, I already have mine put in, but I figure I'm the only one with my name. So you'll all wanna fill that in with your information. Uh, short bios, so bios are kind of hard sometimes to write, but the shorter, the easier they might be. Um, so you don't want more than two lines here. These two lines, the, their only job is to demonstrate to the reader, reader that you are the person to give this talk. This is where you're being persuasive. This is where you're telling people how awesome you are. 
and some of us might be tempted to, you know, downplay our awesomeness. This is not a point to downplay your awesomeness. This is a point to brag. Uh, you're also going to need your talk title. And talk titles are, it's super tempting to make talk titles super clever. But you need to resist the urge. The folks deciding on a lightning talk may just skim titles, and if they can't tell what your talk is about, if your title is too clever, your talk won't make it through the initial review process. You want something straightforward. This, by the way, is not a detail that is carved in stone. The title that you have on your proposal may not be the title that's actually on your lightning talk. Hopefully they're very similar, that you're not trying to pull like a bait and switch or anything, but the audiences are different, so the titles can be different. You also want a talk description. This is, you know, the meat of what your lightning talk is going to be. Uh, this can be bullet points. It doesn't even usually have to be a paragraph. I like to always work in threes because I can always remember to put three things, and if I can't find three things, then I probably don't have a full lightning talk yet. Uh, if you have a big reveal in your talk, by the way, put it in here. Do not leave uh, your reviewers guessing because we're trying to convince the reviewers they need as much material as possible. Uh, and if you've got a really good twist ending, the reviewers are not going to give it away to the audience. They're gonna let you shine. And lastly, you need a big idea or a takeaway. What exactly are people going to learn after, after hearing this talk? And it can be simple. It can be audience members will learn to identify Python programs versus PHP programs. Something just straight up easy. Uh, but it's just a piece that a lot of reviewers want to see. So, <clears throat> um, I also want to note that if you follow the instructions of a submission process and fill out all the forms, you are far and above more likely to actually get through the submission process. Uh, a lot of potential speakers do not fill out all the fields on the forms, so it's an easy way to get a leg up. So I'm going to give you about seven minutes to go ahead and go through this and think about how you would fill this out. You don't need to write like a full paragraph for your talk description or anything like that. Bullet points are just fine. But think about that audience. Think about what a talk reviewer is going to want to see from you. All right, any questions? What's that? Uh, oh, I had a note on that. Um, anything about Python is fine, but if you don't have a topic, you can do a talk about why a new programmer should choose Python over another programming language, <laughs> since you might have been thinking about that already. And if anybody has any questions, please just grab me and I'm happy to come help.
All right, how's everybody doing? Need more time or I think we can start talking about this a little bit? All right, we'll start at the top of the list. Okay, I'm pretty confident that y'all have name and email address on your own, so we're not gonna talk about that. But let's talk about those short bios really quickly. So, why are you awesome? Does anybody have like a bio that they want to share that talks about how, they're how awesome they are? Okay, let's hear it. that's not awesome. You do things. That right there is awesome. Um, if you want to amp up the uh, bragging a little bit, I always like being able to say like a specific project name you've worked on or anything with a big number. People are very excited to hear, oh, I've supported a product with a million users or something like that. If it is a big number, people just tend to get excited because big numbers somehow make a lot of people feel like you have more credentials, especially in this sort of situation. Uh, but I think that's a really good like bio for a lightning talk. You've got who you are, you've got why you're an expert. That's pretty awesome. For, for a Python conference, that is an extremely persuasive piece of information. Knowing somebody is a contributor or a maintainer definitely, definitely gives you a little bit of a credential as a speaker. All right, what about talk titles? I gave you a version of a talk title, but you, are, you may have also gone off and done something entirely different. So who, who would like to share with you? Like? Was that a hand? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I like that one. I like that. Like earthquake, that, I don't know. Sounds like something I would want to know. I don't want to get stuck in an earthquake. That's a good title. Anybody else have a title they like? I would say that that comprehending comprehension, uh, that is a little bit clever. You can probably get away with it in a community that like is already familiar, but for a community that might be um, a little bit less experienced, you might want to be more explanatory in your title rather than, I mean, I like alliteration. I like alliteration in a title too, but save that for the, the actual lightning talk. All right. So talk description. Does anybody have like a bullet point or two they'd be willing to share? Aaron, I think we're just gonna get to hear your whole talk here. Yeah. You've got a, a very straightforward takeaway. You've got clear points that connect to it. Um, it sounds like you're giving a very clear picture to the reviewer of what they would be getting in a lightning talk. Anybody else want to share part of theirs? Or we can also move on because we're running out of time if nobody wants to volunteer. I won't force anybody to. Oh, though, by the way, there are lightning talks at Python at PyCon, and since you all have written proposals, if you like your idea, put it up on the, the lightning talk board later this week. Um, oh, we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to skip a slide or two because I don't think we will get through them. 
All right, so let's skip ahead to writing for other people. Uh, so far, we've mostly talked about writing and editing on our own, but we do belong to a thriving open source community where we can work with other people. Sometimes we can even get paid to work with other people, which is just the most novel thing I've ever heard. Uh, but we do need to like know what opportunities are available. So writing about Python, uh, there are some standard opportunities that you'll probably run into. Uh, writing talks for PyCon and other conferences is a pretty common use case. Documentation we all talked about a little bit. Um, documentation is often suggested as a great entry point for new contributors who aren't yet confident in their technical skills. Um, I'm going to... I'm not necessarily comfortable with that. That's a little like having an intern handle all of your social media. If you are talking about working with somebody who's a little bit newer, you need to plan how you're going to mentor them, how you're going to work with them to make sure that they have the capability to do the job. <clears throat> Documenting open source projects is usually a labor of love, so you may not get a lot of choice in who you get to work with. Uh, but you can always support people to become better writers and editors, just like you can support people to become better programmers in the community. Uh, documentation also can be one of the more financially viable options because a lot of companies will pay uh, documentation writers both as employees or contract. Um, if we're talking about blogs, there's there are people who pay for blog posts, um, but the it is a lower rate because a lot of people are interested in writing blog posts. Uh, there are tons of websites that run material about Python. All of them are always looking for more material. Uh, the PSF blog, for instance, uh, welcomes guest posts. They're always looking for guest posts about the community. And they pay freelance bloggers who work with the site on an ongoing basis. Uh, tutorial websites often operate about the same way. Um, they'll often pay for tutorials, um, or some of them will pay for tutorials and ask for guest posts for free. It can kind of balance out depending on where you're looking. Uh, written and uh, tutorials are not the only option. Video tutorials, which you're going to need to write the script beforehand, uh, also tend to get premium rates when con compared to articles. There's books. I am not necessarily recommending anybody write a book, uh, especially if you're doing it for the money. I've written several books, and I don't think I've ever earned enough to cover my time and sales from those. That said, if you do have a topic that is book worthy, if you have that book inside of you that is bursting to get out and you are willing to put in the time, there are loads of publishers with Python lines. There are tons of publishers who are looking for Python books specifically. You can always self-publish, of course, but being able to work with a professional publisher means gaining access to editors and technical re reviewers and marketers uh, rather than having to do anything yourself. And if you are thinking about book proposals, um, come talk to me afterwards. There are some publishers in this sphere that I would definitely recommend over others. <coughs> so as you're writing all this material, hopefully you're going to wind up with just a file folder full of things you've written about Python. And that means you can repurpose material. Uh, like I said, I'm very lazy. I don't want to do any more work than I have to. So I will take pieces and I will repurpose them. For instance, if I was going around and pitching a Python, blog, a Python book right now, I'd probably have 10 to 20 blog posts that I've written about the topic of that book that I could just, you know, add some tr transitions in between them, reword a little bit, and put into a book themselves. Uh, writing for just one purpose, especially when uh, a lot of technical content doesn't necessarily... Um, you need to adapt it for different audiences, but the underlying information remains the same. Uh, you can do a lot of that sort of repurposing and do a little bit less work. And aside from getting two projects for maybe 1.5 times the work, uh, it also gives you more material to persuade editors and publishers to work with you. Um, also, conference content committees like seeing that sort of thing. If you've got published blog posts about a topic, you're an expert in that topic. 
it doesn't necessarily matter how long you've been working on it. The fact that you have enough knowledge to write out the piece means that you're an expert to your readers. It makes you a known quantity, which makes you easier to work with because people who are working with you will have a better idea of what to expect from your skills. Uh, most editors and publishers, even for guest posts, will want to see at least some sample of your writing before they're willing to commit to a project. So make those writing samples do as much work as possible. Uh, certain sites, or rather a lot of sites that routinely publish content about Python or other technical topics will have specific site requirements. Luckily, they'll usually share these details so that we can easily review them and submit. Uh, submission guidelines can be anything from an email address and a couple of sentences to a fairly elaborate document. And we are going to look at opensource.com. So I'm mentioning opensource.com because their editor is here and he is specifically looking for Python articles. So. Uh, that makes them a great place to put in for right now. Let me, all right. So in this document, uh, opensource.com gives us like the basics of, the basics of how they want things sent to them, like what file format, where to send it, basic questions, those sorts of things. They also give us like their full writing and style guide. They tell you what strange, uh, what spellings they, they're looking for, um, if there's any formatting that needs done, uh, what kind of images they want. They also tell you like exactly what kind of articles they want. They're really interested in these 500 word short articles. They also have a longer piece that's more of a magazine style article. Uh, and they also want big, long tutorials. Uh, so those, those are the three sort of categories of articles that they're looking for, which makes it a lot easier for us to write exactly what they're looking for. They, this is a little bit rarer, but if we go down far enough, I'm having trouble finding it right now. But they do tell us information about their audience. So they give us more information to add to our personas. For instance, uh, they tell us that most of their readers are uh, Linux users. So as I'm writing, I'd probably look at a persona that I would think has Linux experience. So my senior dev, absolutely. My newer dev, I'd have to think about like exactly what they might know. They also talk about their licensing. Um, unless you're really focused on freelancing as a career, licensing is not something you have to hugely worry about. Um, but I'm happy to talk about that more later because that is a whole other tangent. Um, oh, and we are right at the end without having, it's 420? I think we wrap up at 420, is that correct? Hmm? 440, oh. Excellent, we do have time for this. Okay, so. So what we're going to do to wind up is we have an exercise where we are going to start an article for opensource.com. We're going to run up against the uh, end of the session so we won't be able to completely finish. Um, but we're going to talk about how we would get there, and I'd be happy to look at any uh, work you do afterwards as well. So one of the reasons I like an exercise like this is because it's more realistic. Um, we're going to use opensource.com's submission guidelines, try to match that, and I'm going to add a couple of additional constraints just so that we can practice our specific skills. So for this exercise, we're each going to describe a Python library and explain its value in 500 words or less. Uh, try to pick a library that you're familiar with because we don't have a lot of time to devote to research. And just for the record, um, in the time we have left, I do not expect anybody to write the full 500 words. It's more of an idea of what you would include. 
um, at least some notes, a vague outline. And I'm going to really, even though I don't necessarily think outlines are necessary for all articles, I am going to really push for everybody to have an outline just specifically answering these three questions. So if we're describing a Python library and we're thinking about our personas, we have our senior dev, we have our newer dev. Our newer dev is probably our persona here. Our senior dev knows enough to go look at a bunch of libraries and decide for themselves. So the things that a uh, newer Python dev might be interested in or might need to know to make a decision, um, what's an example of how a library has actually been used out in the real world rather than you know, a school exercise? Um, if there's any knowledge beyond what's in the library that you need to have. Um, and then why is this library better than competing libraries? And if you truly can't think of or find any competition, it's totally okay to just say, there is no competition, nobody else is doing this, if that is in fact clear. So don't worry about getting spelling and grammar absolutely correct. This is that, that first draft where you just sort of get things down on paper. And normally I would suggest doing a quick editing pass before handing it over to someone, but since we're a little bit cramped on time, um, I am going to come around and look at your first drafts. Um, no judgment or anything, but just a little bit of personalized feedback on how you're doing and what's working. Um, I have some style guides up here that I will leave open if anybody needs to double check anything. We probably won't get that far in the process, but those resources are here. And yeah, we have 18 minutes left, so let's see how we're doing in 12-ish minutes. Any questions? A newer dev, yep, just tell them about a Python library that you like and just answer these three questions. Yeah, bullet points are great, but you're just thinking about what would be persuasive to that younger audience, or newer audience, rather. Newer devs aren't the same thing as younger devs. And uh, just in case anybody needs it, the, I'll pa paste that URL on as well.
All right, so it is technically the time at which we are done. So I'm just going to say a couple of things and then I'm happy to stay and keep going over stuff with folks. Um, but if you have some place to be, no judgment. Um, just in wrap up, there's a couple of uh, resources. If any of this really sparks something that you wanna dig deeper into, um, Jacob Kaplan Moss has a blog series that he did in 2009, but it's still super relevant, um, that just sort of talks about uh, writing about Django and uh, how to do some very specific uh, writing very well. Um, my projects I am biased about, of course. Um, Sin and Syntax, if you need something about the mechanics of writing, this is one of my favorite books to recommend. Um, it's not only like very thorough, but it's very readable, which is incredibly rare in a grammar book. And then lastly, uh, Write the Docs has years of talks about documentation and other writing up on their website. And any topic that you wanna dive into, they probably have a video about. Uh, so I would recommend any and all of those. And then Here's my contact information. I will be around the conference all week. I am very happy to look at drafts, give feedback, anything like that. Just come find me. Um, I'm also on the internet, and you can find me at these spots, and I can give feedback on the internet as well, because this is the future. Um, and that's, that's everything I can tell you about writing about Python during a workshop. <laughs> <laughs>